Okay, this morning we're going to be looking at a chapter of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. And because we're continuing this theme of the church, uh, one of the key Pauline books concerning the church is this letter to the Ephesians. Um, in here we have teaching concerning the gifts that God has given to the church. We find that in chapter 4. Uh, and we have uh, depictions there of how gifts are to be used for God's glory and for the building up of the saints. Uh, more importantly, we have a feature of the redemption that we have in Christ at the beginning of the book that is to the praise of God's glorious grace. And also in this book we have one of the most succinct and clear teachings of redemption, of salvation, uh, how when we were dead in sin we were redeemed, we were regenerated and brought to life by God. And here in chapter 3 uh, we have more about the church. In chapter 2 Paul says that he broke with, with his death, Christ broke down the middle wall of partition that separated the Gentiles from the Jews and together brought them into one new man. So at this point in, in, in his discussion, uh, he's talking about the, the, the whole people of God being the temple. Um, he says, uh, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Uh, in, in our Sunday school lesson today, we looked at chapter 11, where God marked out the temple and the place of worship as his people. And so here Paul is echoing the same uh, concept. Our text begins in chapter 3, beginning verse 1, and we read, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness, and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Let's pray. Well, thank you for this wonderful book. Thank you for this section that we have the privilege to look at today. God, I ask that you be lifted up and glorified in our hearts. Thank you so much for Christ our Lord. It is in his name and for his sake that we ask your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise.
praise the Lord. This is this is a rich text. I, I really like the book of Ephesians. Um, it's one of my, my favorite Pauline writings. Um, and, and I think it, it I, I can't remember who it was that said it, but uh, it might have been uh, one of the uh, British scholars of the 19th century. He said that Ephesians is the crown of Paulinism crown of Paulinism. Uh, this is kind of a, a real honorary expression to this letter. Um, of course, Romans is probably the most famous uh, of Paul's books, but Ephesians is, is a rare gem. It really is a, a uh, book that, much like Colossians, which it emulates to some degree, uh, is compact. It gives you a, a, a a sort of miniature Romans in chapter 2, uh, but also gives you things that we don't find in other places. Um, the language that we find in chapter 4, the succinctness of the statements concerning the faith of what it means to be in the Christ and what it means to be the church when he says that we are to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. This is a rich, rich, rich book. And even in this very chapter that we read, after the section we read, Paul continues in prayer. And he says that, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This section we'll look at next week because there's two statements that I want to draw your attention to. The first one is here in this text that we read. Um, and of course, the focus is that ministry that we do for Christ is done as the church as the church. And here it says in verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. By the church. Or some translations say through the church. Okay? So let me draw your attention to that one for now. And also in the other section of the same chapter, which we'll look at next week, but I want to draw your attention to the verse here, is that we find the same idea in verse 21. It says, Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Again, we have something that reflects the glory of Christ in the church of Christ. The glory of Christ being reflected in the church of Christ. That we'll look at next week. But both of these texts are important because they highlight the significance of the church in Christ's economy, in Christ's ministry, in the plan of the Father. And of course, here we're told that it is a manifold, wise plan. So, when we look here, the first thing we see is Paul, number one, identifies himself as the prisoner of Jesus Christ. You remember that he is, in this instant, writing this letter, actually a literal prisoner. He is in prison when he writes this. But now he's referring to... So the fact that he's a prisoner, not of the Romans, but he's a prisoner of Jesus. And as one person said, you know, um, if you are captive of Jesus, you are truly free. So the people who think they're free, they're captive to their sin. But those who are captive of Christ are the ones who are truly free. So that's why Jesus said, if the Son <laughs> set you free, you are free indeed. But you're only free when you are a prisoner of Christ, as Paul says here. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. And this word dispensation does nothing for the dispensationalists. Um, 
even though the term is found here. What it means is the household management, the economy of the plan of God. And here he's speaking of this grace of God, which is given to me, but guided toward the Gentiles. You've got to remember that Paul was a minister particularly called as the apostle to the Gentiles. That is, everyone else, except the Jews, of course, everyone else was a Gentile. You know, the, the, the Jews divided the world between us and them, between the Jews and everyone else. So, you know, uh, often, often the Greeks would do the same. They would refer to everyone else as barbarians, and they obviously Greeks with their language, their culture, and everyone else who spoke a foreign language. It was like they say they would say bar 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 bar. That was where the barbarian idea comes from, from the way that these other people speak. So if you're a non-Greek speaker today, then you're a barbarian. <coughs> I, on the other hand, speak Greek. I'm not a barbarian, <coughs> even though I'm using the barbarian tongue to tell you. All right, so here we have it, the dispensation of the grace of God. Paul recognizes grace given to him, and look at what he says, that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And here's a parenthesis, right? If you jump down to verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So let's just stop there for a minute because we're identifying what the mystery is. The mystery is this message that God had hid in himself <coughs> and now is revealing to Paul as an apostle and to others who are apostles and prophets of the New Testament age that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. This is so rich. In the original, what you find is that God is doing something that is truly remarkable and he uses <coughs> the Greek preposition with which is, in Greek, it's sin. Sin. Very simple. It means with. Now, when you hear it, you won't understand the language, but you will hear these expressions where it uses the sin language, or sin language. Okay? I'm just going to read it to you. Το μυστήριο του Χριστού, ο εν ετερές γενναίες, ουκ εγνωριστεί της γης των ανθρώπων, ως νυν απεκαλύφθη της Αγίας Αποστόλης αυτού και προφήτες πνευματή, είναι τα έθνη συν χλωρανό και σύσσωμα και συμμετοχά της Ευαγγελίας αυτού εν Χριστό. See these expressions, three different expressions. It doesn't come out, the assonance of the original doesn't come out in the translation, but what he's saying is they become fellow heirs, fellow part, you know, partakers, and they are... Uh, you know, the same body. So you have this sameness, withness. It's a withness together with the Jews on equal footing. Now the Jews knew that God would one day bless the Gentiles, but the Gentiles were always considered to be a second-class category. That even if they were going to be blessed by God, they were going to be second-class citizens with Israel Israel considered Israel to be the head of the nations. And what Jesus has accomplished, according to chapter 2, 
it says that he is our peace who hath made one made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God so what does Jesus accomplish on the cross well one is that he breaks the the middle wall of partition it was an actual literal wall in Jerusalem marking out again from our message this morning the court of the Gentiles from the inner sanctuaries and the people of God and the non-people of God, the Gentiles. Here, this wall is figuratively broken down. And now, out of the two, God brings one new entity. Jews and Gentiles now form one people of God. Ethnicity has nothing to do with it. Ethnicity has nothing to do with it. And so here, this is what Paul is saying, that the mystery has come by revelation, and he is making it known. Well, Paul says, I already wrote to you in a few words what he just said, primarily in chapter 2. And as you read it, you'll understand, he says, that the mystery is the mystery of Christ, the person of Christ, and it's in Him that these realities become experientially had. So, now, Paul goes on and says, the Gentiles, fellow heirs, same body, partakers of promise, by the Gospel. The Gospel brings redemption. The Gospel brings salvation. The Gospel brings this new entity, the Church, into existence. Why is that significant? Well, because today, among other things that we have to combat, is a teaching that the Roman Catholics like to pronounce that they gave us the Bible, the Church gave the Bible. According to this text, it's the Gospel that makes the people of God. It's the Gospel that brings together the Jew and the Gentile and creates the Church, not the other way around. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. So, God gives grace to Paul to preach the gospel. The gospel brings people together, and he says of himself that he's not really worthy, and all of this. What is it that he's to preach? Well, to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable riches of Christ. You study Christ, you will never exhaust them. You can study Christ for a lifetime. You'll only gather a glimpse. The unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden in God, which is who, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent and now, here is the, the, the focus of what I want to get at is to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now this is gonna this is gonna occur in two ways. Number one, it's gonna occur in the very existence of the church made up of Jew and Gentile. It's just going to happen by virtue of the reality of the church existing as Jew and Gentile together. This will be announced that God's wisdom is manifold. manifold. When in the letter to the Romans, Paul has spent a long time defending the gospel in the earlier chapters. And when he gets to Romans 9 through 11, he deals with the problem of what we call the Jewish issue. The Jewish
Jews were one of them. And so through 9 through 11, he ends up speaking about the fact that not all Jews, ethnic Jews, are Israel Jews according to the Spirit. In other words, there's an elect Israel out of all of Israel. Okay. And when he, and he's already talked about the Gentiles before, so, and here he speaks more about that in here, 9 through 11. But what I want to draw your attention to is when he ends this entire discussion, going from Romans 1 all the way through to the end of chapter 11, he ends with a doxology. I praise the God. And he says, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways, past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? and it shall be recompensed unto him. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. A doxology, right in the middle of this book, after talking about how God has redeemed Jews and Gentiles together in one view. This is an amazing, amazing idea. And of course, this is what Ephesians is getting at. That by the very existence of the church, this is being declared. People just looking at it can see something that is so different from the use of tradition in Judaism, which is ethnocentered. To be a Jew, you have to be born a Jew. You can become a Jew, you can become a proselyte, but you're not really a Jew. You can never really become a Jew. You can become Jewish religiously, but you never become an ethnic Israelite. Their religion is keyed to their ethnicity. But God's purpose from the beginning, when he formed Israel, he said to Abraham, through you, blessing is going to spread to all the families Not only the Jew, but also the Gentile. And the gospel comes along, and what does the gospel say? The gospel is the power of God and salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Together. Brings them together. One new entity. The very existence of the church is going to be the means whereby the manifold wisdom of God will be known. And it will be known... Notice, principalities and powers. Now, principalities and powers, what is that? It could be anything. The powers that be in this world. Kings, rulers. What did Paul say? He separated me to go preach. He said, you will stand before kings and proclaim this. Christians have stood before parliaments and confessed the truth of the gospel. It's a principalities and powers. And even in the spiritual realm, even if no one else hears they hear. They hear. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Jesus builds His church. Jesus keeps His people. Jesus will be glorified in His saints. It's one way. That's one way. Through the very existence of the church. The second way is through the ministry of the church. Through the proclamation of the ministry, through the activity of the church, through its daily existence and action. Not just that it is, but that it is alive and well. It continues to function, it continues to impact, and the church becomes like that mustard seed. It becomes like that what do you call it? The leaven that leavens the whole. It is that seed that will branch out and become like a big giant tree for the birds to come and nest in. This is the hope of the gospel that through the ministry of Christ, 
the manifold wisdom of God will be manifest that nations will flock to Christ. Not just Jews. Nations will flock. In fact, you find this teaching in the Old Testament already. But one, one instance of it is in Isaiah chapter 2. Let me just read that to you. It says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall come. Uh, I'm sorry. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of zion shall go forth the law and the word of the lord from jerusalem and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. One instance, and of course there are many, many more. In the book of Revelation, when the heavenly realm is depicted, the nations come and bring their glory into the city. The nations bring in the glory of the nations into the city. What is that other than the very glory that God gives through this gospel? It says here that the intent now is that the manifold wisdom of God will be made known by the church, by its existence, by its ministry. And when the church is the church, when the church breaks down barriers and unites people in one calling, in one faith, when it, when it promotes harmony, when it does as it's supposed to, as the body of Christ, it is declaring a message that God is sovereign. He is the one who unites us. An early picture of this is certainly the disciples. When you think about the disciples, think how diverse they were. On the one hand, you have somebody who's a zealot. All right, Simon, who was probably one of the Sicarii. They're the ones who went around with daggers, these small daggers. And they would go up to people and stab them in the back and kill them. All right, Simon the zealot. And on the other, you know, extreme, you know, the extreme right, if you will. On the other hand, you have someone like Matthew, who's in league with the Romans, who's a tax collector. All right? You can't get any more polar opposite than these two. And what does Jesus do? He brings them into the band of the, you know, band of the disciples and brings them together and, and unites them in Christ. All right? Can't get any, any more diverse than that. The gospel continues to do this when the church brings people of diverse backgrounds, diverse, eth diverse ethnicities, diverse socioeconomic conditions, brings together people that otherwise might not have anything else in common. But what they do have is unity in Christ. This is the manifold wisdom of God. And it's through the church, being the church, that this is pronounced, propagated, proclaimed, preached around the globe, around the world for the glory of God. So, by the church, we need to be the church to exist and 
It's a function. It's not enough just to say, well, we, we are a church and we exist. We need to be the church, but we need to be a church in being. We need to be continuing, active, ministering. And when people see what God is doing, they will give praise to God. They will recognize that this is not the wisdom of man, but this is part of the manifold wisdom of God. Only God can do this. Only God can do this. So it doesn't matter what your loyalties are in the arena of sports or politics or whatever it may be. It doesn't matter what you like as your favorite color. You can sit across somebody in the church of God that rails just as loudly for their color. You like blue, he likes green. So what? When it comes to Christ, we're all one. Everything else pales into significance, to insignificance, when it comes to who we are as the church in Jesus Christ. So a question can emerge from this. Are we contributing to the being of the church? Are we contributing to the ministry of the church? Because the church is nothing more but the congregate of individual believers. Those who have, as Paul says, been forgiven of their sins, been made alive in Christ, are saved by grace, are his poet, being his workmanship created for good works so that they will walk in that. So in Christ, you are a part of a whole. Are you doing your part? Or are you forgetting your lines? Are you doing your part? Or are you forgetting your lines? God has given us a plan. God has given us a calling. God expects us to be obedient when we are. All praise goes to God. I trust that we will learn today from this text very, very briefly that it is by the church, it is through the church that God is to be praised. I can't help but think of that, that, that word from Peter that we are the ones who proclaim we announce, we testify to the excellencies of God. This is what the church is about. And I pray we all do our part. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you continue to be gracious to us. And you give us great privilege. And we thank you that we are brought nigh unto Christ through the blood, and especially we Gentiles who had neither God nor hope in this world, nor Christ, have now become partakers, and they are fellow heirs, and we are the same with the house of Israel. We are the new Israel, Jew and Gentile together, one church. God, we praise them, our midst guide each one of us to serve and to function and to give you glory. We ask this for Christ's sake.